Hey everyone, welcome back to another double AMC free practice exam breakdown. This one's going to be of the psych Soch passage number three. If you're not familiar with the channel, my name's Maggie and I'm a uh, professional MCAT tutor. I run this channel alongside my brother who is also a professional MCAT tutor. So let's jump right into the passage. So first things first, I always like to see if there's a title and there's not. Awesome. So I don't flow chart a whole lot on uh, psych -so passages, but every so often I will. A lot of times they're focusing on figures or uh, basic sciences that they will mention explicitly in the passage or research methods. It starts off with the presence of others has been shown to influence individual behavior in a number of ways, including improved performance on basic or familiar tasks and inhibited performance on more complex tasks. So this is starting to sound like the optimal arousal theories, the social facilitation versus inhibition, all that kind of stuff. So already in your head. In a study, researchers hypothesized that individual attitudes would also be influenced by the presence of others, even when there's no direct communication between the individual and those surrounding them. So what we were kind of talking about was performance being related to being surrounded by others. Now we're talking about attitudes being changed as a result of others being around. Participants were randomly assigned to complete a simple card sorting task administered by a male or female research assistant. Half of the participants were administered the card sorting task alone, while the other half were administered the task at a table along with other participants. The administrator of the card sorting task displayed a positive, smiling, consistent eye contact, pleasant tone of voice, or negative, scowling, poor eye contact, and impatient foot tapping attitude by using a variety of nonverbal cues towards half of the participants in each condition. Okay, so we have like a classic, like four group kind of thing going on. I'm going to actually draw it out down here. So we got one variable being, are they alone or are they with others? And then we have another variable. Is the person mean or are they nice? The administrator. So I didn't have to take the time to, to draw this out because I see that it's probably going to be down here. Um, but I just do want y'all to be so, so, so familiar with this kind of like two variable four group kind of situation. Therefore, participants were in one of four treatment conditions, negative administrator alone, positive administrator alone, negative administrator with others, or positive administrator with others. So it, they laid it out for you. I really did not have to draw this thing down here. After completion of the task, participants were asked to independently complete a questionnaire about the demographic variables such as age, gender, and race and ethnicity, and to rate their attitude towards the administrator of the card sorting task, zero being extremely negative and 10 being extremely positive. Figure one shows the average attitude ratings that participants of the study assigned to the administrator in each experimental condition. So as usual, they're not going to give us the results of the study because that would make psychosis just even easier. So they're going to make us um, look at uh, our own figures. So there's no title to this, but we will read the figure caption. It says participant attitude toward administrator based on grouping condition. Next, I like to go to a key if there is one. So the black bar is going to be a positive administrator attitude. So that's going to be when they are nice. Um, and the gray bar is going to be when the administrator was mean. Next, I want to look at my axes. So over here on the y-axis, we have participant ratings of administrator. And so remember we said um, 10 was going to be good and zero is going to be bad. Then we have their grouping condition, whether they were alone or with others, um, kind of right here. So the first thing that I see is that, holy crap, there's like a huge discrepancy when people are with others. So when they were with others, they had more extreme attitudes about whether the administrator was nice or mean. We do see definitely like a difference um, even when they were alone, but with others, it was like, like a huge difference. So I just want you to kind of be able to brainstorm the results of graphs um, pretty quickly there, 20 to 30 seconds. So if y'all were looking closely, I think um, I just gave you the answer to the first question, but it's fine. We're going to move on. The first question, which is number 15, says which conclusion demonstrates a fundamental attribution error when interpreting the results of the study? So first things first, what is fundamental attribution error? That is when you attribute other people's behaviors to something that is inside of them. It's dispositional. It's who they are. It's not because of their situation that they're in. So someone cuts you off in the road. It's because they're a shite person. It's not because they were really late or they're driving their wife that's in labor to the hospital or something like that. We never think about the situation. Um, well, that's what the research says is that we never think about the situation. Whereas kind of the opposite of that is when we think that we like the things that we do 
Um, if they are bad, they are due to the situation that we are in. So, okay, so we know we are looking for the fundamental attribution error um, in this study, and we know that fundamental attribution error is going to be a dispositional thing. So I'm just looking at the answer choices a little bit, and I see that we're talking about dispositional versus situational. Always think dispositional. Other than that, I didn't really get a whole lot of fundamental attribution error stuff in this passage. Like, I didn't really, like, notice that that was, like, a part of the study or anything. So I'm just going to do my best here. A, dispositional attributions of others' behaviors are weaker when attitude ratings are influenced by the presence of others than when alone. So that's definitely not right, right? When influenced by the presence of others, like when others are around, other people's behaviors, like how we feel about them, are much stronger, right? That's why we saw such a large, like, discrepancy. It's like, if they were really nice, they were like, oh my gosh, they were 10 out of 10 nice. If they were mean, they were oh, the meanest person we've ever met when we were with other people. Whereas when we were alone, everybody kind of falls in this like middle range. So definitely not. The attitudes are stronger. B says dispositional attributions of others' behaviors are stronger when attitude ratings are influenced by the presence of others than when alone. So that is kind of uh, what I was saying when I was explaining A. It's like they were much stronger with other people. Now, whether or not this, these were dispositional or situational is kind of like up in the air. Like, I feel like it's a logical leap to say that these people didn't take situation into account, or maybe they couldn't have because the situation was controlled for because it's an experiment. I don't really know. But I do know that attitude ratings were stronger with other people. So that also helps me mark out C, right? So looking at C and D, C says that um, the attributions of others' the behaviors are weaker. So that means there's going to be less space in between the bars um, when you're alone than when you're with others. So that's actually true. Now, I will come back to this in a second. D says that your attributions of other behaviors are stronger when you're with others than when you're alone. So C and D are actually saying the exact same thing. But the problem with both of them is that they say situational. And you, we are talking about fundamental attribution error, which is definitely like a dispositional type thing. So I don't really like this question, but it is what it is. Number 16 says, if participants in the study rated the administrator's attitude more inconsistently in the alone condition than in the with others condition, then... so. Some people think they were nice. Some people think they were mean. Or if that happened more in the alone condition, then what would that mean? A, the mean in the alone condition would be higher than in the with others condition. Okay. I see that we are drawing a line between. So this is a research methods or like a statistics question. Okay. So this question is actually asking like, if we were more inconsistent, how would that change the statistical layout of one condition? Okay. So... That makes a lot more sense. So the mode, I can't really predict how that would change without knowing the actual scores, you know? And besides, mean, median, and mode are all part of what are called measures of central tendency. And so it focuses not on the outliers, but on kind of what was the most um, average, what was the middle score, what was the most reported score. Central tendency is kind of what it sounds like. And also, like, the median is... People actually use that when they're talking about like test scores or whatever in the median score. It is better than the mean is at uh, getting out the outliers and like not letting them influence the score. But regardless, still, it would be a logical leap to say that I know that the mean is going to be higher in the alone condition than in the with others condition because they were more inconsistent in their answers. Were they inconsistent in the high direction or the low? It's kind of hard to say. But I would know that the standard deviation would be different, right? Because if we have more outliers on both sides, probably... Um, then we are going to have a larger standard deviation because the standard deviation is a measure of variance. It is not a measure of central tendency. So for sure, D would be the answer there. If that was confusing, like please comment down below and let me know. Question 17 says, in the study, what is the most likely outcome if participants exhibited social facilitation? So I actually said this earlier, social facilitation. And what is that? Um, that is the tendency for you to perform better if others are watching you. There's a flip side to it called social inhibition where you perform worse when others are watching you. That's um, that's what I have. So what would be an example of people doing better when others are around? 
A, participants who are with others will look at others' card sorting strategies and use a similar strategy to complete the task. So that's cheating. So that's not really what f- social facilitation is it's getting at. Your, truly your own performance, just how it is influenced by other people. B says participants who are alone will perform better on the card sorting task than those who are with others. So that's the opposite, right? That'd be an example of social inhibition. C says participants who are with others will perform better on the card sorting task than those alone. So definitely, right? Like that's the whole, they didn't even try to like really trick us here. They just asked pretty much, do you know the definition of social facilitation? D participants who are with others will exert less effort to complete the card sorting task since they are pooling their efforts towards attaining a common goal. I don't really know what that would be called. Um, But regardless, social facilitation, again, is not about effort. It's just about your performance. Based on the elaboration likelihood model, which type of processing was most likely induced by the administrator when interacting with the participants? So the elaboration likelihood model, I hardly ever hear it like actually like called what it is. It's mostly like when you hear about this, it's that theory that talks about like central root versus peripheral root um, in talking about trying to persuade someone to do something. So the central root is kind of what I think of as like a more mature thought pattern. It's like things that actually matter. Whereas the peripheral root is, um, appeals to emotion or, um, just like BS that doesn't matter. So the classic example is like when you're trying to buy a car, um, the central root of processing would be to or like say you're trying to sell someone a car because it's a persuasion thing. The central root of processing would be like, yeah, this is, this is a great car for you because it has great gas mileage and, um, it has a great, uh, safety rating and like things that actually matter. Whereas the peripheral root of processing would be like, yeah, man, Matthew McConaughey was the actor that was trying to sell this car on TV. Don't you love Matthew McConaughey? Like just crap that doesn't matter. Or like the hoes going to love this, like the, the red color of the car, like it, that's it's stuff that doesn't matter is peripheral root. So what was the type of processing that was most likely induced by the interact by the administrator interacting with the participants? Honestly, it was probably peripheral because like the, the attitude of the administrator does not matter in the grand scheme of this task that they were told to do, the card sorting task. Um, it was just like something that just was distasteful. It was an appeal to the participants' emotions, made them feel like they were being rushed or whatever. But that's actually not important to the central root of processing. So not B. Now, what are A and C? I don't, I've never really like heard of them. Honestly, I've only ever heard of central and peripheral root when talking about this model. Um, but I can only assume that they probably mean central root. And I know you're like, Maggie, how are you assuming that? I'm assuming that because that's the only way that I can logically pick D and not have a second thought about it. Because I know that D is like right and that is something that is a word that is a phrase that is commonly associated with this elaboration likelihood model these are not phrases that are commonly associated with that model and they kind of sound like i mean careful processing that sounds like central root that sounds like you're caring about things that matter high elaboration like higher thought more mature that's kind of that again kind of sounds like central root and so really i'm just saying i've never really heard of these but peripheral root makes sense. I can't mark peripheral root out by any any way, shape, or form. So I'm just going to say that e, A and C probably mean the same thing as B or very similar. Okay, that's the end of that passage. It was a short one and I uh, hope it was helpful and fun. Make sure if you took anything from this video to please hit like and subscribe to our channel so that we can keep making this kind of content for you guys. If you want to check out our free four-month MCAT program or um, our Discord channel, or anything, any of our products that are up on our website, everything's going to be linked in the description below. And make sure to comment uh, what you want to see next. Until next time.